It's a real privilege for me to introduce my colleagues. Dr. Ashrith Guha uh, completed his residency at UT Houston in advanced heart failure training in Iowa and has been part of our uh, program now for several years and really integral. One as our, I, I like to consider you as our formal stats guy. He has a master's of public health and a focus on ep epidemiology. Um, but really has been in integral in, in improving upon our efforts to better understand RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, LVAD, and outcomes, in addition to clinical expertise in cardiogenic shock. And Amir Abbas, I've introduced before, or one of our advanced heart failure uh, fellows will help to present the case. Um, Dr. Eddie Suarez, I do see here perfect, is uh, the director of our lung transplant program, associate director of our LVAD program, and our go-to uh, surgeon, so to speak, for cardiogenic shock. So he'll be part of the panel, and near um, you're part of the panel, uh, along with me. And let's uh, let's jump into the last session. We're in the stretch, 20, 25 minutes. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. So uh, the format for this is going to be, I will have Amir uh, present a couple of cases, and we'll um, pick the brain of the panel here and uh, put them on. Try to put them on spot, and uh, we'll have a few audience response questions in between, and uh, um, and then in the end, I'll try to uh, you know wrap this up by uh, giving you a few pointers in terms of how we manage cardiogenic shock here. Okay, Amir, go ahead. All right, so we'll start with a couple case presentations. So our first one is a 68-year-old African-American male with HEFREF, uh, LVEF less than 20%, uh, secondary to a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, AFib, a CRT, D, COPD. He presents with several weeks of worsening dyspnea, weight gain, abdominal bloating, and leg swelling. He says that lately he's been having what we would classify as NYHA class 3B symptoms, and he's had several heart failure hospitalizations in the past six months. He's initially admitted to a, a local community hospital for decompensated heart failure, and due to end organ dysfunction, AKI, volume overload, he needs to be started on dobutamine. Uh, and because he's continuing to get worse, they initiate transfer to Houston Methodist Hospital for an LVAD, or heart transplant evaluation. So when he comes to us, uh, this is on dobutamine. His blood pressure is 104 over 68, a MAF of 80. Uh, his heart rate is 80 because he's had a uh, AV nodal ablation. He's V paced, uh, by V paced. He's an older African American male. He's got a JVP of 20 centimeters. Uh, his cardiac exam is notable for an S3. He's got a loud holosystolic murmur. His lungs are clear, but he does have some ascites and he's got significant edema. So, looking at his labs, they're notable for uh, hyponatremia, a BUN and creatinine that are elevated. He's got a lactic acidosis, uh, elevated bilirubin, low albumin as well. He's on Coumadin, but his INR is sort of in the higher end of therapeutic, and his BNP is greater than 5,000. So just looking at his chest x-ray quickly, I mean, typical of an advanced heart failure patient, he's got a CRTD, he's got a very dilated uh, cardiac silhouette. And then here is his echo here. So clearly a very remodeled heart, significant LV uh, dilation, an EF less than 20%, as we mentioned, and evidence, at least by echo, of some RV dysfunction as well with a dilated RV, uh, a dilated and hypokinetic RV. So these are his hemodynamics. This is on dobutamine once again. So a MAP of 80, an RA pressure of 15, a PA pressure of 43 over 26, a mean of 32, and a wedge pressure of 25. His cardiac index, both by thermal and FIC, are ex severely decreased, a cardiac index of 1.1, 1.2. Uh, so clearly in cardiogenic shock, uh, no matter which way you look at it. So for our first audience response question, what do we do next? Do we add an inotrope? Uh, add a vasopressor, put in a balloon pump, go to ECMO, uh, or put in some sort of uh, temporary MCS, impella or tandem heart. So, 
Amir, think, hopefully, hopefully you get to the panel at some point. Yeah, yeah. No, this, is, here. this is when I'm going to get to the panel. Yeah. So I think, uh, no, that's why I'm sitting here. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, so I just want to uh, you know, start off with uh, Dr. Uriel. You know, you um, have a patient like this who's in, you know, sliding on inotropes with uh, continued uh, cardiogenic shock um, uh, and even on biventricular filling pressures which are high and... Uh, what, is, what would be your uh, approach in terms of doing so, the next step? So first of all, this is a patient that we see every day. Okay, this is a classical patient that we all see. Inotrop, CVP is uh, elevated to the 15, wedge is elevated to the 25. However, the flow is extremely low, cardiac index of 1.1 or 1.2, depending on which method. The parameter that you didn't mention, and I calculate to myself, is SVR is 2,080. Meaning that for me, definitely, I will start with intraortic balloon pump and maybe add some milrinone eventually also to this. But uh, I'm still not jumping now to ECMO and to temporary support, uh, uh, like Impella or Tandemat immediately, due to the creatinine is, is elevated, 1.9. But it's still something that maybe we can stabilize, understand what is the next step, is probably we'll need a, a chronic support as soon as possible if it will be ELVAD or if you decide that you can stabilize him enough in order to reach him to transplant if he is a candidate. However, right now I will probably put an intraotic balloon pump and another nine drop dealing with this SVR and see what it will take me. However, when I do that, uh, we are getting numbers repeated, both urine output and hemodynamic number on an hourly basis, and we change our mind very, very fast. I'm not going to wait for the morning, rather than if in uh, two, three hours he doesn't turn the corner, is not going to, uh, we're, we're going to move to the next phase of uh, temporary mechanical circulatory support. Andy, if I were to call you and say, why don't we do an Impella 5.0? <laughs> uh, actually, I wouldn't argue with it if you really wanted to push it. But, 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 <laughs> that is but a honestly, perfect like, response. But, um, uh, surgically, I look at how much time you have for this guy. He's hemodynamically stable right now, but as Dr. Uriel noted, he is in heart failure, so he does need some advanced support. You don't need ECMO yet since he's not <laughs> crashing and burning. For me, ECMO, it's our, our, our bias is to preserve that for people who are you know, more severely sick, that you need to salvage the body as well as the heart. Right now, the heart is failing, and and the inner boom pump, it may, depending on how big it is, it, it may be able to salvage him. But if he's a larger guy and you know he's going to need an advanced failure, it, it's not outside of, you know, but what I would think of normal to go ahead and put in a 5.0 in this gentleman and, and uh, optimize him as best as possible because this gentleman is definitely going to need some advanced support. Yeah. Jerry, let's say he also had VT with an ICD shock just before we did this right heart. Would your management change in terms of what support we, you would consider? It depends on how he looked with, in the presence of the VT in terms of worsening hemodynamics, which one would argue that he would have. But I'll take a few steps back because I think the case highlights, one, the common acute on chronic heart failure. The presence of clear lungs with chronicity doesn't imply, can, for many patients, can be associated with revved up lymphatics and they may have bronchial breast sounds. There was some pulmonary edema, but you have a wedge. So I'm glad you have a swan. One of the take home messages is define the hemodynamics. The clinical exam would have suggested perhaps right sided heart failure out of proportion to left sided, but the echo and hemodynamics confirm that the LV is overtly remodeled and the wedge is high and it's right sided heart failure in the setting of secondary pulmonary hypertension in the setting of left sided heart failure. So we're talking about right, uh, that in a, in a clear way. The reason I bring that up is there's evolving data about balloon pump response in the setting of RV failure. And, and here I was trying to uh, see if that was going to be the case based on hemodynamics, which you hopefully will address. Uh, your so that would be the next question. Oh. Do you want to go to the next question? So, 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 so I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I've been introducing people all day. I mean, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but so, so the answer on the boards, if you have an SVR of, of, of 2,000 in, in the presence of a low output and low stroke volume with clinical heart failure, you can vasodilate. You have a swan in, and you can see if you can augment output and improve the hemodynamics. I'm not, I, I'm not enthusiastic. So I think of the answers you chose, and I think what we would do is we, we'd probably do both at the same time. Yeah. But I think the balloon pump is first line in this case, and the, the decision on understanding response, I agree with my colleague here, that is measured in the order of hours, not several hours. And you gave us a lactate, we're gonna be looking at urine output, we have a swan to track wedge and, and output. And the end game here is blood pressure, which is already okay. And it's, it's actually a good prognostic sign he's, his after load is high from a, from a potential need of non-response and ECMO need. So this guy's typical, I have a little bit of reassurance, if you wanna act quickly with small increments of reevaluation. So perfect segue to the next question. So. Uh, 
I don't know if this is. You want us to predict? Response. Yeah. Can, but it seems like our panel would that, say to uh, respond. You know, we all can predict that somebody is going to respond to a balloon pump or not. So, so uh, yeah, I'm activated. You guys got me activated. <laughs> so, so for an individual patient, it's hard to predict. There, there are studies. Susie Joseph, our colleague, you know, put forth an investigation based on cardiac power. Um, to try to tease out balloon pump responders versus not. I mentioned the RV. Those, some have looked at um, the severity of uh, RV failure as estimated by CVP. The Columbia Group has a nice uh, observation coming out. Um, to, to suggest that perhaps RV failure um, um, would be a, associated with less, less response. Some people have always questioned non-ischemic versus ischemic. Um, with the idea for some reason perhaps non-ischemics non don't respond. So for an individual patient, I, I don't get caught up in journal club with the team or in my mind. Um, you're gonna, in my mind, put it in and de de define response clinically. So at this stage of the game with the paucity of data, I think it's hard to predict. Nir, no? uh, So in order to add to the data from Suji, Suzy, we just published our experience. We've also 150 uh, intraortic balloon pump to decompensate the heart failure. I think it's important, first of all, to mention this is not acute MI compensated with cardiogenic shock. This is cardiogenic shock of decompensated heart failure that they do can benefit from a uh, balloon pump. Uh, again, the Respond that we look at was actually whether or not you have 30% improvement in CVP and wedge and cardiac index versus what we call complete response, complete normal uh, CVP that to take it to below 12, wedge below, below 18, and cardiac index above 2.2. In that regard, uh, actually a patient with uh, elevated PA pressure have actually a better response in, to, in order to to balloon pump, uh, if I don't remember exactly his PA pressure, what it was, but I think that uh, they were decent enough compared to the CVP. The CVP, I remember, was 15. The PA pressure was, um, I think, in the 40s or so. 37. 37. So I think I think he have a chance to be a responder. What we know that exactly as Jerry said, I was sure that mitral regurgitation patient are responder, and then I learned that in statistical it didn't came that they are responder. Right. Eventually we just need to try, but correct yourself and don't think that your ego is going to be affected if you're going to put a balloon pump and after one hour you switch back to and you said put an impeller into. Yeah. Just you know, do the switch. Yeah, and, and because I think we don't know as a community what surrogate's equal response, hemodynamic. I would argue that the clinical response is the right, the end point. And so which parameters best are associated with that? Is it cardiac output increment? Is it wedge and cardiac reduction and or lower um, cardiac output? Is it our augmentation in blood pressure or the lack thereof? I really don't think we know at this, at this really? point. There's some discordance in signals, certainly out there, but uh, in this case, even in the presence of this severity of heart failure, I would, I think he has a pretty good chance and we, we would do it quickly. Yeah. Okay, so let's see what happens. So I think as uh, was discussed, he, we started uh, putting a balloon pump, put, in, uh, put him on some millernone, decreased his dobutamine, and kind of as we may have predicted, he had an excellent response. His renal function improved, lactic improved, INR came down and his hemodynamics clearly show uh, significant improvement. RA pressure, uh, wedge reduction, uh, cardiac index at 2.2. So I think that's a good example of a balloon pump responder, sort of as we discussed and maybe predicted. But don't sit on your uh, success right now, because when you have a patient on balloon pump and two <laughs> inotropes, it's only a question of time. So, so Amir, that's exactly right. Remember, success, so what, let's talk about it. What, what is success for this guy? Now, is it stabilization where you optimize the meds and then get them home? So is success stabilization to discharge them home, obviously without a balloon pump or inotropes? Or is it bridging him to a permanent LVAD or transplant or recovery? I would argue the likelihood of recovery here in a real way is very, very low. So none of this is success right now. Yeah. This is, you, you proved you've stabilized the patient. That's good, but I'm sure we're gonna get into the goals that are more meaningful. Furthermore, sure. I think that uh, in your first slide, you put some very important points that now come into to the to you. We have to make sure that we remember them. His sodium upon admission was 128, meaning that his chance and uh, and there is a beautiful Greg Funero assessment from the adhere 50,000 patient data. He's going to die. His BON was above 50, so 54. He's going to die, and he had readmission of heart failure. So. 
Now we need to decide. I don't think this is a patient that you target recovery. He's, uh, he's in the 50, 60. Right now, acute recovery, I mean. Uh, he's already had multiple readmission, sodium-128, elevated BUN creatinine upon admission, stabilize, or you move to a LELVAD, or you try to see what other thing you do, but as soon as possible. So exactly as you guys said, this is clearly someone end-stage heart failure. So the balloon pump and the you know, medication changes did stabilize him, and he did end up getting a DTL VAD and was discharged home, and now is doing fairly well. I think this was one of our recent cases. So agreed this was used as a bridge to a more durable strategy, which was- Did you, did, did, were, I mean, did you wean the balloon and or anotropes to help define end-stage disease, or was the thought that, for everything appropriately mentioned, his in-house mortality is in excess of certainly at least 25% based on it here, but with the need for anotrope uh, and the other surrogates, you know, probably flip of a coin, yeah. Um, so was there any wean attempt to define that, or you just said, hey, we saw enough, this is end stage, let's move on with the DTI? No, I think in this particular case, we were able to wean him off inotropes, and he uh, remained relatively stable, but uh, even despite that, he still required the balloon pump and uh, was not able to be weaned off. And because of his history, as we said, the markers of end stage disease, as soon as he hit the door, it was felt that he needs a more durable Fair enough. Uh, Would you even try a wean in somebody no, like so, that? So I was asking a question, right? I'm the <laughs> panel guy. So I, 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 think, I think if you achieve near normal filling pressures, all this is borderline, right? Mean pulmonary pressure is 25, wedge is 16, credit condition. You're barely there exactly. on a balloon dobutamine milrinone. So no, I wouldn't be weaning anything. Um, at, at this point, we'd be deciding stabilization. This is optimization for next step. But yeah, so it was glad, I'm glad to hear that. You've increased his post-operative outcomes. You've improved them as well. His chance of renal failure and liver failure, pulmonary failure, they've all, I mean, the reason the post-operative success is better is because you've got them preoperatively improved. And that was the main job of what you did, and, and it worked. I want to mention another thing that was important because um, we put in an LVAD into a patient, and what are the numbers that really matter in order to predict whether this patient will have RV failure after an LVAD? And now you have an RA of six, and you have a beautiful, uh, uh, you have a PA of, uh, a mean PA of 25, and a puppy of, uh, let's say, uh, 23 div uh, divided uh, by six, so you have a puppy of almost four. But in originally, you have a little bit less optimized because you did your action. You see that this RV and more pulmonary, probably the pulmonary bed is more amendable, and maybe his uh, chance of getting this elvet without getting into trouble with RV failure is better than we thought. And I think actually an interesting anecdote in this patient, uh, when the referring physician had sent him over, he had a, that same concern. He wasn't sure if the RV would be good enough given the initial echo and some of the initial hemodynamics. But I think this case is an example of optimization uh, to kind of re reveal the underlying RV. But it was an original concern, right? As, uh, that, the edema, ascites, his RV was big by LV, by, by dimensions on the four mm -hmm. chamber, and his CVP was a little bit more reassuring. We looked at it internally, and the ones that were associated with RVAD in our patient population, Cormo score, pressure requirement, and RV size relative to LV size with a cutoff over 0.75. So on presentation, Right, it, it, not the highest risk, but yeah, moderate. Definitely moderate. And so, so Barry Trachtenberg for our group put this concept of melding a patient to improve outcome, right, or to better outcome. And while we don't have to get into the details of that, I think optimization works. And so this worked out well as a good case. Okay. You wanna to go to the next, next one? Next case, yeah. okay. So let's go to our next case. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. So this is a younger patient, 31 year old white male. History, no prior medical history, but a significant history of alcohol abuse and also a family history of heart failure. So he presents with several months of fatigue, dyspnea, weight gain, leg swelling, and at time of presentation, he was having NYHA class four symptoms, barely able to do anything. An echo was done at an outside facility due to these symptoms and showed an LVEF of less than 20%. He was admitted for a first diagnosis of decompensated heart failure and over a few days required escalating, escalating doses of diuretics and had to, be, had to be started on an inotrope. So a transfer again was initiated to Methodist Hospital for higher level of care. So looking at his initial presentation to our hospital, he was on uh, two drips, dopamine and dobutamine, JVP elevated, he was tachycardic. I think we talked about earlier about how Dr. Felker mentioned tachycardia as a concerning sign. 
He had an S3 uh, systolic, holosystolic murmur, some ascites, uh, hepatomegaly, uh, edema, and cool extremities. So his initial labs, again, BUN and creatinine elevated, sodium on the lower end, uh, LFTs were abnormal, uh, T bilia 1.9 and albumin 2.7, elevated lactic acid, and a BNP of uh, almost 2,000. So his chest X-ray shows uh, enlarged cardiac silhouette, maybe suggesting some chronicity, although this is his first presentation to a medical facility. And then his echo here. <sighs> So again, although this is his first presentation, the echo suggests some chronicity with a remodeled heart, uh, significant biventricular dysfunction. So this was his initial hemodynamics, and as mentioned, he was already on two drips. So a MAP of 79, heart rate 107, an RA pressure of 24, uh, PA 70 over 46, a wedge of 46, and a cardiac index 1.4 to 2.1, still definitely below the normal range. So sort of as our last case, uh, what would you do next? Add an inotrope, same options. Add an inotrope, a balloon pump, ECMO, or something uh, more like a temporary MCS, as, such as an impulse. As people are answering, you know, again, this patient is a definitely different patient. Different patient. It's a right. different patient completely because the first thing that is so different in him is his age. So, uh, all the time I'm, when I'm speaking with my team, I said that young people are lying. They look better than they are, and he is much, much sicker than we think. Second thing, we have to remember that this is something that Jerry, we didn't mention in the previous discussion on balloon pump. Young people are not good responders to intraotic balloon pump because of the elasticity of the aorta. Part of the advantage of balloon pump is that you have some calcification in the aorta, and when you counterpulsate, you counterpulsate again some, some stiffness. And we see it more and more and more. Balloon pump in young people doesn't work so well. Third, he's already on pretty high doses. He's on dopamine 5, dobutamine 5, and he is in wedge 45. And I will do another teaching point here. So you have the thermodilution and the discordance between thermodilution and free cardiac output. Your free cardiac index was at uh, was 2.1. Your thick thermodilution cardiac in the, uh, the thermodilution cardiac index was 1.4. There is a beautiful paper that came out from JAMA on almost 10,000 right out calf. If you have a discordance, you need to go with the thermodilution. If the thermodilution is low and the thick is higher, the thermodilution is a better predictor of the outcome of the patient. This is a patient that I will be more scared and I will go with temporary mechanical sepultory support now. I will not play with him. And definitely know that he's already on two inotropes. He's, he's almost there. Jerry? So, yeah, I, I agree with that. Different patient profile. The one thing in his favor, super sec, is his trajectory. This is acute de novo shock. And so when you look at the IMAC trial in terms of those patients that had true recovery, albeit in the context of needing short-term support, many with, a, with an LVAD as a bridge to recovery, their likelihood of achieving that is, is better compared to uh, other forms of heart failure. Assuming he doesn't have coronary artery disease, he's relatively young. LV size does matter, and what is of concern is how big his LV is. Some we argue about the cutoffs, right? Seven versus above six. So, so I, I'm still thinking exit strategy in the context of um, of, of poor response to what we do, and I agree. He, compared to the last person, is likely to be a poor or balloon pump responder. Um, now, having said that, would I not place it? Uh -huh. All right, that, right, I'm trying to dodge. Would, would I not place it? Um, I've seen patients that are just like this, where it's the equivalent biventricular support, and and just surprise me with balloon pump response. And so, and I know for me to go to I, I'm not thinking Impella 2.5. The Impella CP, our experience has been, it's certainly a stronger pump, it's been, but, it, but it's been mixed. I know I have to orchestrate either one of two things for temporary mechanical support. Call Eddie and do an Impella 5.0. That means organizing the hybrid suite or the OR. Um, that could take hours, not minutes. And I can have a balloon pump in to see his response, which I would argue is at least cleaner than ongoing onotropes and, and that potential stress. So even though my enthusiasm for balloon pump as a responder, I agree, is less, I think I'd still put it in because we can put it in at the bedside right then and there. 
Um, and I don't think it's going to hurt if you do it, you know, carefully. So the benefit risk, at least wanted to know, again, we'll close follow up with a higher likelihood that it's not going to work. All those caveats, I think I would place it, but I would be having that conversation with with Eddie about prepar preparation for next step. Yeah, that's about to say, I, I wouldn't wait for, for this guy. You can place the balloon pump, but I, this was gentleman, I would probably wouldn't wait to see his response. He's, he's already incredibly sick and he needs a higher level of support. I would call right away, because like Jerry says, it is gonna take a couple hours. It's not as quick as balloon pump, but, but I wouldn't, but because of that, I wouldn't wait that extra hour or two hours to see a response. Right. I would go ahead and start organizing everything right away to, to get him to the operating room and, and place him the, the higher support. And now, another risky here is his creatinine is 2.9 already. 2.9 creatinine in a young, young guy. Yeah. No, he's super sick. Yeah. So I think we kind of already know how, what we, what would happen in this case, but uh, seems like we think he may not respond to balloon pump. So, so you want to tell, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so let's see what happens. So a few days later, he has a balloon pump. He's still on dobutamine and his hemodynamics are still bad. Uh, so but so, two, no. so balloon placed, in, in two days of support? Yeah. Okay. The so balloon pump, so hemodynamics still bad, CVP high, wedge high, index what is still no. What creatinine? What happened to his kidney function? Uh, I think at this time his kidney function was still in the high twos. Yeah, it didn't improve. It didn't improve much. And we were having some diuretic resistance. We were not able to, you know, get the CVP down. So... I have now to say, if you can go back back to this slide, another thing that is very concerning about this the previous number, the CVP is 20, the PA diastolic is in the 20s, the wedge is in the 20s, this heart is barely moving all around. And um, again, this is uh, what we're afraid from young people that uh, that, that is uh, receiving balloon pump. It's the decision needs to be fast. So now what, or as we mentioned, the next step in this case was we moved to Impella 5.0. And so he had an Impella 5.0, a uh, little bit less dose of inotrope, but still on an inotrope. And unfortunately, hemodynamics, you know, filling pressure wise, not much better. Index is improved, blood pressure is a little bit, uh, still is about the same, uh, but filling pressures are still high. And renal function was a little bit better, maybe creatinine in the low twos now but uh, still not normal. So Amir, one would want to challenge this to adjudicate the degree of unloading. You would mm -hmm. think that the 5 would certainly be more than the balloon pump. I think that's well established. And so that heart size was big. So I would, I would want you to show me an echo so I understand that there wasn't malposition, that this impella was, was positioned to do well. Because that, that, you know, you could bring out RV failure, certainly with left-sided support, and that I would accept it was his risk for, he presented with our biventricular failure. But to see a wedge not move much, uh, and it, when going from balloon to a 5-0 is less typical for us. Near. I, I am completely agree. I'm looking at it. With, so first of all, definitely we have to remember that whenever we do all those maneuver, we do them with uh, Lasix drip, Umex drip, whatever, mm -hmm. diarrhea into it, and or complete nephron block. This is one too. I'm completely agree with you. To see that the wedge is stay the same, a little bit surprising. However. For me, the cardiac index of 2.3, side by side with CVP of 21, and Papi, again, I will calculate Papi here, it will be, again, the way I do it is I take the PA systolic, I reduce the PA diastolic, so 41 minus 23, it's 18, and I divided it by the CVP. So if we see a Papi that is uh, uh, above, above 1.8, we are more relaxed. If we see a Papi that is below 1.8, a little bit stress. If it's below one, it's really, really stressful. His papi is 0 0.8. So I think this was immediately after an impella. I think after a few days of support, his numbers did get better, but his wedge never came down below 15. We were still a little bit on the, on the higher side and CVP continued to be high. And uh, we are seeing in some of these patients who do have biventricular failure that impella 50 is not really unloading to an extent of an actual LVAC. I mean, you know, Impella 5 does better than a balloon pump, but even though it is providing five liters of flow, it doesn't do as good. Uh, uh, but this, like patient a need a, this patient need a biventricular support. So all you, you add to this Impella 5 or you add an Impella RP, or you do a, a protect duo on the right side. So I think, I think now the, the, the clinical context is, okay, he, you have a mean blood pressure of 76. That's not bad. Mm -hmm. 
You're concerned about the kidney. He's still congested. He's in smoldering shock, but you've been doing this for a few days. So in my mind is what's the extra strategy? Yes, we can put a, a, a protect, do, we can do a temporary RVAD to try to optimize, maybe better fill the LV. I would think that that LV was big enough, right? And you had enough RV reserve, but maybe we fill the LV better and we can just unload him more aggressively with biventricular. I think that's, that's important, but what is, I'm thinking, what is the extra strategy? Right. You know, we've got a young guy with significant biventricular failure that's not a candidate for a heart transplant, given the severity of illness, right? We don't take Intermax one or 1.5 to, and then I think he had some alcohol. He also had social yeah. issues. So which the coordinators would be right, <laughs> would be yelling at us if we were even talking about transplant. So we would talk about it though, and put them on the radar. But, but so, so an LVAD, right? A permanent L, what is the, I'm, I'm thinking an LVAD is super high risk. But we have to remember that sometimes the RV just need a little bit of unloading and it can, it can come back. So I, I first of all, just because of his youth, and again, the psychosocial is going to be a key element here. But if it seems to be that he's someone that he see the light, and, uh, and it's true that during the, um, when everybody see the light when they're so sick, but if it seems to be that it's true, I would have wanted to give this guy a chance. Agreed. But Agreed. probably to do biventricular support, move to a, a, a durable LVAD, and only after a durable LVAD, slowly, slowly win the LVAD eventually. So the proposition is, a, is biventricular support to a, a VAD with a planned RVAD for at least a few days to see if you yeah. can baby the RV to have a, a LVAD configuration as a bridge to Canacy down the road. Yes. For destination. I agree with that because the reality is we have no other option. But in this case, this patient got a DTL that he actually didn't need an straight, RVAD. Straight, straight, straight forward. He went straight yeah. to LVAD. And actually, as from what I remember, he didn't have too much RV failure post-op. No, actually, his creatinine improved within a couple of days. And the amount of unloading that he was able to get with an actual LVAD, his you know, wedge pressure came down to like 10 with an LVAD, which Impella just couldn't do. And I think with just bringing the wedge down, his CVP was down to like 9 but or 10. On, on clinical okay. rounds, if we don't, because you know, at the end of the day, his mean blood pressure is reasonable. But if we do agree to a DT VAD with high risk RV features like this is, we would, we would uh, at least talk about the Berlin Bridge strategy, right, Eddie, or planned RVAD up front. Did he have that? We'll do the Berlin Bridge, but he actually, I think, came off without too much complication, mm -hmm. even though his wedge, and I mean, his CVP was elevated. He was generating some, you know, elevated PA pressure, yeah. so we do know the right heart was able to pump some, at least enough to generate that. But he, obviously, all the PAPI, the, the Cuomo square, those are all incredibly high. Yeah. But that just kind of goes yeah. to show we're, we're not enough. the best at, I feel like, we're always not the best at predicting where heart function, and we may be overestimating the degree of Fair risk enough. that people Fair are enough. by ventricular failure as we've gone along. Yeah, with, it seems. You know, with all the scores that we have, including the new Intermax or the Euromax, you know, the best AUC you can get is 0.7. So I think prediction has its role, but I think it is still. Uh, I mean, there's so, a lot of there. No, there is no doubt. But then the reason that we try to predict it before, because there is study that show that if you go a priori with an RVAD, you have a much oh, better, be, be, better be, outcome. Be, yeah, no, I think so, we should be prepared. No yeah, yeah. I, and I, I think that, uh, again, the youth is yeah, uh, give honestly, him a lot of luck, absolutely. and that's the reason he went yeah. through that. Yeah. Uh, I think that sometimes uh, we better do, and lately we did a couple of cases like that, that we just do the pericarvad, and then after a day or two, take this pericarvid out and felt much easier in the creatinine and not struggling with the um, uh, renal insufficiency due to RV failure. Okay. Thank you. Thank Ash, you. is that it? No, I have a presentation. We're already 3.30 now, so I'll... You want to just... Uh, so why don't we do this? Just take, um, take, home, take home points. Yeah, I think, sure. yeah, we can just probably... Just do uh, take home points for two minutes. Two take home points. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a pre our relationship right now, Jay. So I'll maybe go to the last slide. Um, let's see. I'll... I'm having. So I, I think one take home point is to, you know, kind of recognize what, you know, where in the spectrum of cardiogenic shock someone is. It's pre cardiogenic shock, cardiogenic shock, or severe refractory cardiogenic shock. I think we at least discussed uh, patients both in you know, cardiogenic and sort of severe refractory cardiogenic shock, and uh, that will sort of help determine what kind of support you need. And one other thing to take home is to recognize you know, these patients, that the two patients that we discussed, like Dr. 
Uriel just said, these are not patients who have acute MI and cardiogenic shock. They are a different set of patients who probably require much more support than uh, you know, the patients who have chronic uh, heart failure and who are coming in with uh, decompensated heart failure. And um, I'm going to try and skip these. Uh, so the key aspects of temporary MCS, one is timing, early initiation of mechanical circulatory support. The level of support, uh, you know, whether they are adequately perfusing, so like we discussed, you know, following up on lactate, looking at serial creatinine, maybe looking at mixed venous to assess perfusion, and if it's not, you know, being reversed in the first six hours to consider additional support. And uh, the third thing would be to prevention and management of potential device-related complications. So the main complications really are device malfunction, infection, and bleeding. So in terms of malfunction, you know, the, the, the position of the pump can be altered like Dr. Eastup was mentioning, so that is something that should troubleshoot at the bedside using echo. Infection and bleeding, mostly long, you know, no longer term complications. So once you stabilize a patient, you know, you've not won the battle yet. So I think having a long term sort of plan where you go to a durable solution is the key. So I think the, yeah, these probably are the three take homes from sort of the temporary MCS part. Um, and I'm going to skip on all of these. Uh, and, the, you know, and like, like we've discussed, all of these um, um, uh, devices actually are able to really unload and do good hemodynamic support. But uh, there are certain contraindications so that you know when you're considering these devices, like Impella CP, we would not consider in a mechanical aortic valve or greater than moderate AIs, though that's a little controversial. Again, aortic valve stenosis, severe peripheral vascular disease, or a mobile LV thrombus, these would be something that you know, would preclude using uh, Impella. And then in those patients, you would consider a tandem heart, if, uh, especially if they don't have a severe peripheral vascular disease. So um, think, uh, ECMO, again, is really in patients who are really uh, having you know, cardiac arrest and ongoing CPR or near cardiac arrest, uh, and especially in patients who require biventricular support with need for oxygenation, those are the patients in whom you would consider AV ECMO. One thing about AV ECMO is it does increase the resistance or uh, the elastance, really, and will make it hard for the LV to unload. So always consider using uh, at least a balloon pump along with uh, ECMO. And um, I, I guess the, the, the big thing is I think we all need to work in a group like we have on, in the panel. There is our advanced heart failure cardiologist, a thoracic surgeon. Oftentimes, if it's in the setting of acute MI, an interventional cardiologist is involved as well. And uh, our approach is really you know, trying to figure out if there is hypoxia or not. If there is, then you go to ECMO. Uh, otherwise, you, know, you start with the balloon pump. And then if you don't have a favorable response, go to a, a higher support. But again, all of this as, uh, as a plan for some eventual more durable option, whether it be transplant or LVAC. I think with this, I'm going to, uh, you know, that's five minutes. So far. Yeah, excellent. Uh, too many. You went over two. <laughs> so, so, Ash, thank you for, for the presentation. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to spend this with us today. Uh, we're just ecstatic about that. And my friend, Nir Uriel, uh, thank you for joining us from the snowy lands of sh Chicago. We hope, you, we hope you get stuck here and we can hang out. Um, and uh, I'd like to also acknowledge all those that exhibited from Abbott, Amgen, Bayer, Boston Scientific, Getting, Gilead Sciences, Medical Healthcare Network Solutions, Medtronic, Novartis, two more, Atsuka, America Pharmaceutical, Pfizer, and Portala. Thank you very much. We look forward to you. Um, attending our heart, our heart and vascular grand rounds as part of heart failure awareness next week, and we look forward to your attendance next year. Thank you.